Probably not exactly on schedule, but close to schedule. Uh, we have some speakers who need to catch planes, for instance. Um, so I want to get us uh, started. Um, we were talking about uh, creeping uh, government power and how one responds to that. And I think what we've seen over the course of the day is that uh, it is um, not only uh, an incident to the modern state, but this has been true for, for some time now, but it is particularly true of the modern state, that surveillance is a part of the, our lives. And that's something that we both desire and dread or, or worry about. Uh, and that um, we ideally want to be in a position to make choices about when we want to be surveyed, how we want to be surveyed, how uh, that data will be used, uh, and how it, how that, what constraints there'll be on surveillance. Uh, so we get to the point of what do we do? Uh, what do we do now that we have uh, explored this potential dystopia, um, maybe not so potential, uh, dystopia, and how do we respond, and what are the array of responses uh, that are available to help us uh, use this for our benefit, but also keep a check on unlimited power that will apparently turn those who wield it into hideous monsters with uh, lightning bolts uh, flowing from their fingers. Um, and we're going to take, uh, our, our last panel is going to take a number of looks at how one might do this. One might do this through the courts. Uh, one might do this legislatively. One might do this by reframing how we talk about uh, what we tend to talk about as a balancing between security and, and rights. Is that the right language or is that, does that language lead us astray? Um, but, uh, but all of that tends towards law talk and uh, we may want to look beyond law to look at other methods of resistance, other methods of responding. Uh, to the power and the danger, the perils, as, as Paul talked about as, uh, earlier, uh, the perils that are inherent in this en enormous ability to collect and sort and use data. Um, I have spoken too long already because I want to keep us on schedule, um, and the speakers are going to have to suffer for that because I am going to uh, identify them and direct you to their bios uh, rather than recapitulating what's in their bios. Um, so we are lucky to have um, three people who are, are well positioned to talk about these questions. Uh, Timothy Casey, uh, uh, Tim Casey to those of us who work here, uh, uh, my colleague um, uh, will be speaking first. Um, followed by Laura Huey, who is an assistant professor of sociology at the University of Western Ontario, which I don't know if you know, we have a relationship with, not the, the law school. Um, um, yeah, I guess that was unclear. And, um, and then f finally, Mary Beth Stein. Some of you may have noticed that she opened the symposium yesterday. Uh, introducing the film The Lives of Others. She still teaches uh, German and uh, International Studies George. <laughs> uh, at uh, George Washington University. Uh, and uh, with that, uh, I give you Tim. Let me, uh, let me begin by thanking um, the, the Cox Center and, and in particular Bob Strasfeld for putting this conference together. Um, I don't know, is this... Uh, no, I was saying, and the Institute for Global uh, Security. And the Institute for Global Security, well, of course, of course, we have to get all of our sponsors in. Uh, no, but uh, I would uh, like to extend a very uh, hearty thanks to, to Bob Strasfeld for putting this uh, conference together, and also to uh, uh, the other panelists. I think that the morning's uh, discussions have been very uh, thoughtful and, uh, uh, and provoking. Um, the the uh, area that I want to um, talk about is, is the area of resistance to surveillance. 
And when I started thinking about uh, what or, or how we might uh, conceptualize resistance to surveillance, um, I, I tried to think of a, of a really good example of resistance to surveillance. Um, you know, the, the paradigm in which we're operating has on one side the interests of national security, um, all of the force and power of our government, um, and we really uh, don't um, have a good example or, or don't have a readily available example of what the other side of that looks like, what the other side of that paradigm or, or equation looks like. Um, so one of the things that, that uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about today uh, are a series of cases uh, that were actually litigated um, and, and are currently being litigated by two of our other panelists, uh, Li Tian and uh, Jamal uh, Jafar. Uh, through the ACLU and the Electronic uh, Frontier Foundation. There are a series of cases that pit um, librarians against uh, the government of the United States. Uh, so let's um, begin. First of all, the area that we're talking about is the area of national security letters. Um, national security letters are uh, um, codified under, well, in several sections of the United States Code. They are investigative tools that are used to acquire information. Um, it's a, 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 a um, request very similar to a subpoena. It's a request from usually the, uh, the FBI that's delivered to um, any one of a number of uh, agencies or um, uh, organizations or individuals that request specific information about other individuals or other organizations. Uh, for our purposes, uh, the, the most significant uh, use of the uh, national security letters falls under uh, an act called the uh, Electronic uh, Privacy Communications Act that's codified at 18 U.S. Code uh, 2709. And I'm going to apologize in advance. Some of the material that I'm covering is very uh, statutorily oriented, um, and um, we just we have to go into the codes in order to, to talk about this. So. Um, I'll try to be brief and, and summarize those, those provisions. Uh, the two significant um, uh, amendments to 2706 occurred with uh, the, the Patriot, USA Patriot Act in 2001 and with uh, the USA Patriot Improvement uh, Reauthorization Act in 2006. Um, the ACLU cases, and, and I say this the ACLU because the ACLU is, is the consistent, um, one of the consistent plaintiffs. Um, the Electronic Frontier Foundation has been involved in, in uh, I think, in several of these litigations as well. Um, so the ones I'm talking about are Doe versus Ashcroft, um, which was in the Southern District of New York, um, Doe versus Gonzalez, which was in the, uh, the District of Connecticut, uh, Internet Archive versus McKaysey, which was in the Northern District of California. Um, the uh, Doe, I'm sorry, the uh, Gonzalez and Ashcroft cases were combined and consolidated um, in the Second Circuit in 2006. Um, so beginning with Doe versus, uh, uh, well, Doe versus Gonzalez is the, uh, is the library case. And you'll notice that the last name, the defendant in each of the cases is one of the uh, attorney generals. So the, it's the attorney general of, of the United States. So depending on the time at which the uh, complaint was filed, it's Ashcroft, Gonzalez, uh, Mukasey. Uh, there's a current case now that has Holder. Uh, so it will change depending on the uh, uh, current um, uh, personnel in office. Um, so in uh, 2004, uh, the, the case was filed. Um, I'm sorry, the Southern District case involved an internet uh, service provider. These national security letters were requests for information regarding uh, internet use, um, the identities of people who were using uh, electronic resources. Um, in particular, the, the first case involved um, a, a national security letter to an internet service provider. Uh, the second one, the Doe versus Gonzalez, was the library case, and that was in the District of Connecticut. Um, internet Archive is a, um, a resource, uh, an online resource that was uh, received in a uh, NSL um, in uh, 2006, or no, 2007, I believe. Um, the, um, uh, the two cases uh, from the, that are in the Southern District, that's the Connecticut case and the New York case, were consolidated in Doe versus Gonzalez. Um, the um, the Doe versus uh, I'm sorry Doe versus Gonzalez the library case was uh, dismissed uh, after being litigated in the Second Circuit and the uh, the other case uh, Doe versus Ashcroft in the is still uh, being litigated in the Southern District of New York. Um, so uh, in order to kind of draw the line here, the battlefront is the public library. 
Um, the Plainville Public Library in uh, Connecticut uh, received uh, a national security uh, letter. Um, the director of the library is a gentleman named Peter Chase. Um, uh, his statement was, as a librarian, I believe it's my duty and responsibility to speak out about any infringement of the intellectual freedom of library pat patrons. Uh, but until today, my own government prevented me from fulfilling that duty. Um, I'm going to show you a very brief video of uh, Peter Chase's statement uh, because I think he can summarize his uh, um, position better than I. I'm Peter Chase. I'm vice president of the board. I'm also the um, chairman of the Intellectual Freedom Committee for the Connecticut Library Association. And in addition to that, I, I, I'm John Doe. Um, <laughs> if I had told you before today that the FBI was requesting library records from us, I could have gone to jail. As a librarian, I believe it is our duty and our responsibility to uphold the intellectual freedom of our patrons. And in this case, my own government was preventing me from carrying out that responsibility. When I and my uh, colleagues received the FBI national security letter demanding access to patron records, I knew that this power had already been declared unconstitutional in New York at a district court level. Uh, the government was telling Congress that they didn't use the Patriot Act against libraries, that no one's rights were violated. And I just felt I could not participate in this fraud that was being foisted on our nation. <coughs> we had to defend our patrons and ourselves, and so, represented by the ACLU, we filed a lawsuit challenging the government's power to demand records without a proper court order. On the day that our case was being argued, I and my fellow plaintiffs could not enter the court building in Bridgeport, but instead we watched on a closed circuit TV from Hartford while in a locked room in the Hartford courthouse 60 miles away. We passed through two security screenings before we were allowed in. The gag order has affected my ability to do my job in many ways. First, in my role as chairman of the Intellectual Freedom Committee for the Connecticut Library Association, I received many invitations to speak about the Patriot Act and its effect on librarians, but I could not accept any of them for fear that I would inadvertently reveal something that I wasn't supposed to know that would reveal me as being the actual John Doe. It was very, very galling for me during that period to see the government's attorney in Connecticut, Kevin O'Connor, travel through the state telling people that their library records were safe while at the same time enforcing a gag order on me, preventing me from traveling through the state, telling them that their library records were not safe. On one occasion, both Kevin O'Connor and myself were invited to the same uh, event sponsored by the Connecticut League of Women Voters. Uh, Mr. O'Connor accepted his invitation. I, of course, had to refuse mine. We were aware that we could risk prosecution if we slipped up. But in the end, it was the government who slipped up when they sent out legal court papers without blocking my name and without blocking the names of Library Connection. As a result, I suddenly had reporters calling at work and at home trying to get me to admit that I was John Doe. For me, I think one of the scariest moments of this ordeal has been when the ACLU told us that they were consulting criminal defense attorneys about the risk of prosecution. Thankfully, um, we are safe now. While all this was going on, Congress was reauthorizing the Patriot Act. The government assured Congress that no one's right to free speech had ever been violated by the law. After the revised Patriot Act was signed into law, the government suddenly decided that our identity was not really a security threat after all, and our, our, the gag could be lifted. Nothing had changed in the case, so my question is, what happened to the threat of national security? Our fight is not over yet. While we won the right to identify ourselves, the question of the FBI's national security letter demand for information has not been settled. The battle continues, but at least now we can speak publicly about our fight to preserve the freedoms that we all hold so dear. I think uh, Mr. Chase, again, is, is, uh, uh, eloquently expresses, uh, uh, again, some of the details of the case, some of the history of the case. 
um, and makes, I think, a compelling <coughs> argument um, for the effect that uh, surveillance um, unchecked and unchecked uh, governmental power can have. Um, let's look uh, a little bit at uh, the use in um, the national security letters and national security requests. Um, sorry, let me. Uh, So this slide shows uh, the use um, of uh, national security letters and national security requests. For the year 2000, there were approximately 8,500 uh, national security requests uh, made. Uh, year 2000 is the year before the Patriot Act authorization. Um, in year 2003, uh, the first year after the Patriot Act, uh, um, I'm, I'm sorry, the year, a year and a half after the Patriot Act, um, there were 39,000 uh, uh, national security requests. That number went up to 56,000 in 2004 and dropped slightly to 47,000 in uh, 2005. Um, so there has been a dramatic increase in the use of uh, this uh, device. Um, in the Patriot Act of 2001, uh, made some changes to the, the national security letters and the national security requests. They did exist prior to that, uh, but they, again, were very limited in their use. Um, in the Patriot Act of 2001, changes were made to four areas, uh, four central areas um, of uh, application to the NSLs. Financial Data uh, Privacy Act, Fair Credit Reporting Act, uh, the National Security Act, and the one that concerns us here, the Electronic uh, Communications Privacy Act particularly uh, Section 2709. Uh, the original Patriot Act uh, prohibited the NSL recipient from, rece from <clears throat> revealing the existence of the NSL inquiry. And that's uh, the situation that Mr. Chase and other librarians in Connecticut uh, found themselves uh, when they received uh, requests for library records from uh, the FBI. Um, significantly, the, the law at that time had no provision for a method to lift the ban uh, it included um, a uh, prohibition on even contacting lawyers. So the, the uh, contacting the ACLU was in some ways a very risky uh, proposition for uh, those librarians. Um, uh, significantly, there was also no uh, mechanism for judicial review. Uh, in 2003, the FBI changed the guidelines for the use of uh, NSLs. Uh, prior to 2003, um, the, the uh, NSLs were not used in preliminary inv inquiries. Uh, they were only used in full investigations. Uh, I should, th there is a caveat, I think, with in exceptional circumstances and with uh, director approval, they could be used in uh, preliminary inquiries, but in general, they were not uh, used in these preliminary inquiries. After 2003, the guidelines uh, created a separate level, uh, a lower level of uh, investigation called a threat assessment. Uh, and the guidelines still prohibited or, or uh, discouraged the use of NSLs in threat assessments, but did allow uh, and do allow uh, the NSLs to be used in those preliminary inquiries and to be used in full investigations. Uh, significantly, uh, also the guidelines changed uh, and the, the um, legislation changed the, the, the personnel who were approving the NSLs. So the shift went from a, a very high level approval to basically a, a field office directorate approval. Uh, and that is uh, one of the reasons I think that you've seen such a dramatic increase in the use of the NSLs. Um, there is a connection to FISA, which was talked, uh, the discussion in our previous panel. Um, the, the, uh, well, the most important use of uh, Section 2709, as described by FBI officials, is to, quote, support at FISA applications for electronic surveillance, physical searches, or pen register orders. Um, so the, the idea is that these uh, NSLs are used to develop information that is then used to um, develop uh, the orders that we, uh, the, the previous panel talked about as being in themselves uh, subject to uh, constitutional question. Um, the reauthorization of the Patriot Act in 2006 did, six did bring uh, some significant and I think uh, some positive changes to the, the national security letter area. Specifically, 2709 was amended um, so that uh, the uh, uh, FBI director or designee had to certify that the disclosure may result in certain enumerated harms. Um, the, uh, 
uh, 2709F is a very significant uh, provision and the result of lobbying by library uh, associations and library lobbyists that resulted in inclusion of an exclusion of libraries uh, from the definition of wire or electronic communication service provider. Again, this 2709 is part of a statute that governs electronic and wire uh, uh, internet providers and uh, service providers. Libraries uh, were deemed to, be, to fall into that category and therefore were subject to the NSL requests and NSL levels. Um, the Patriot Act of 2006, uh, Reauthorization and Improvement Act of 2006 also uh, allowed a provision for judicial review under a separate uh, piece of statute uh, called uh, Section 3511. Um, so the question now is, uh, is uh, where are we? Um, one of the things that, um, you know, the, the questions that we have is how were these NSLs used? Um, we do have the benefit of an uh, Office of Attorney, uh, I'm sorry, Office of um, uh, the OIG report uh, where the um, use, uh, misuse, um, and uh, uh, misapplication of uh, uh, national security letters was reported uh, or contained in a report to Congress uh, through the Department of Justice. Uh, among the findings were that the FBI uh, significantly underreported the use of national security letters. Uh, that uh, they sought information not um, uh, permitted by the statute, that the issues, uh, that, that NSLs were issued uh, without proper authorization, um, that they issued over 700, quote, exigent letters, uh, unquote, uh, requesting 29, uh, 2709 uh, uh, information without following the, the proper process, uh, that they repeatedly failed to properly adhere to the FBI's own internal uh, guidelines for uh, the agreements. Um, while the report concluded that there was no criminal conduct, uh, they did uh, find that the FBI's uh, uh, use of NSLs violated uh, the NSL statutes, the Attorney General's guidelines, and uh, the FBI's own policies. Uh, and that's contained at the uh, OIG report at page 124. Um, the question I think going forward is what to make of this. I've tried to present a paradigm of uh, where we are. Um, you know, one of the issues is um, uh, what are our responses? Uh, there are certain primal human responses such as anxiety and fear. Um, you know, if you do some of the um, uh, neuroscience research, uh, the human response to fear and to anxiety or to stress um, provokes a, a very uh, immediate response and uh, triggers part of what we call the reptilian brain or the, the middle brain. Uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, the idea is, though, that that's a very, um, very innate response. It's a very evolutionary embedded response, and it's not a rational response. So in times of fear or anxiety, it's very difficult to rationally uh, approach an issue, to rationally discuss an issue. And I think that in our current situation, we've been uh, subjected to uh, a constant barrage of, of fear and threats uh, in an attempt to, to, to derail the rational uh, discussion. Um, when you think about the, the surveillance as a possible method of deterrence, it, it provokes several other questions. Um, can we agree on the specific conduct, views, activities, or ideas that we seek to deter? I mean, I think certainly we can uh, agree on some uh, criminal activities that we'd like to deter, but the scope of surveillance actually uh, deters far more than that. Uh, can we develop a tool so precise as to deter only some activities or only some thoughts? Some of the problems with deterrence is that there's no real agreement on what exactly deters. Uh, some folks say punishment deters, uh, capital punishment deters, greater punishment deters, uh, lesser punishment deters, uh, seeing uh, you know a, a more uh, rational response might deter. Um, there's uh, divergent research on the field of deterrence and there's no real agreement on what does deter. Um, there's no, also no agreement on what should be deterred. Uh, again, aside from criminal acts, there's uh, not, uh, well, there's not, there's not agreement on what types of views or ideologies should be approved or should be deterred. Um, the unavailability of a pre precise tool and the lack of proof that deterrence actually works leaves us in a very difficult uh, position. Um, the final thought is that we're in a position where governmental authority has far exceeded 
uh, the, the range of, uh, in my view, what was granted. Um, the, um, the question is really, did, does our constitution, does our system of government create a limited grant of authority from the people to the government, or is that a, a grant of all powers, all encompassing grant of power and authority to the government, unless there has been some reservation or carving out or prohibition on certain types of action. Uh, I think that what we've seen over the, and it's not been a, a, a very immediate process, it's been a very long process of uh, a shift from very uh, limited government, a limited idea of government in our original constitutional design to what we have now, which is a very incredibly expansive uh, view of federal government, in particular federal government powers. Uh, and we have a corresponding uh, dissipation of uh, transparency in government. So at the same time that our government is stronger and more authoritarian, we have less idea of what is actually going on. Uh, let me leave you with uh, a, a quote from 1984. The first slide, I think, of the, 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 uh, the day was uh, 1984 versus 2009. Uh, and this is uh, 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 the thoughts of uh, Winston Smith as he begins to uh, engage in the um, act of writing a diary. Whether he wrote down down with big Bro whether he wrote down with big brother or whether he refrained from writing it made no difference. Whether he went on with the diary or whether he did not go on with it made no difference. The thought police would get him just the same. He had committed, would still have committed even if he had never set pen to paper the essential crime that contained all others in itself. Thought crime they called it. Thank you. You don't want me to present with this. <laughs> you're, you're welcome to. It might mislead them into thinking that's what you're talking about, but whatever you're comfortable with. Uh, maybe we can just minimize it. Oh, Lauren. Whoa. Oh, Whoa. <laughs> uh, well. Big Brother doesn't want me to talk about them. Is there a way to, to <laughs> help? Oh. Technology. Well, we can just leave it as the background. I'm sorry. I said That's anything. a very interesting background. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody will be paying attention. They'll be mesmerized. For those who watch it on the internet. Yeah. Do not adjust your screen. Right. Ah, <laughs> oh, there we go. Okay. Put it on. Just, on, just on a black screen would be great. Yeah. Too. That's not me. <laughs> I'm haunted by this thing. <laughs> <laughs> there we hey, go. Hey, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, this is going to be a little bit of a departure for, for you folks uh, because I have absolutely nothing to say about the law. <laughs> Invite a sociologist to a legal conference, and she will inevitably discuss sociology, and, and that's what I'm going to do. Um, this question of resistance and the idea of resisting some of the things that we're talking about is interesting to me. But what was fascinating was listening to some of the speakers this morning, and I kept hearing a phrase, either in the presentations or in comments or even in casual chat, which was this idea that people just get used to it. If you don't like some, eh, why complain? We'll just get used to it. And I think it's a really interesting idea when we're talking about issues around surveillance and privacy because I think the problem is much more complex than that. It's not that people just get used to it, but that a lot of the issues that we're talking about today are actually what have been termed elite concerns. Um, I had no idea that there was a 1973 Privacy Act I had never heard of U.S. versus Miller. Um, I'm Canadian, so I get an out on that. Uh, but I bet you if I walked to the Starbucks just a couple blocks over and I started just polling people, what did you think of U.S. versus Miller? 
they'd be like, who the hell is Miller? Um, and then if I start to ask some questions about what their privacy expectations were with respect to their bank documents, they'd start to maybe get a kind of gray sheen to their skin tone. And especially if I started to go on and then say, well, did you know that Congress did this? Did you know there was an exemption? By the end of it, they'd probably be stroking out. Um, the reality is, again, a lot of these issues that we're talking about, we're talking about them, we find them interesting, but the broad general public has no idea about things that affect them unless it's brought to their attention. And so if you don't know there's a problem, you don't know there's a problem. As well, a lot of times when we talk about these things, what we forget is that most of us in our daily lives, when we're making decisions about what is an issue for us and what's not, we do a cost-benefit calculus. We are homo economicus. And that means we're thinking about whether or not we want to act on a particular issue or subject matter based on our own interests. And a lot of times when we talk about these issues, we don't even know not only what the problem is, but what the costs versus the benefits are to us. And so when we talk and we say, well, people just get used to it, it's not clear to me that they, that they know what it is that they apparently have gotten used to. I actually would suggest that a lot of people, if they were made aware of certain specific things that affect them or maybe not affect them directly but have the potential to affect them, would be really pissed off. By the way, for those of you that don't know, pissed off is a legal geography term. <laughs> um, and I've got some suggestions. I mean, we can point to certain things. Look at the f what, we, what has been termed the Facebook fracas. I didn't know when I signed on Facebook, uh, way back whenever I did, I signed up to see what my friends were doing, what was the buzz about Facebook. I had no idea, even after going through various pages and panels, that they uh, reserved the right at that time to keep information that I posted about myself, to publish it, and it, once I deleted my account, that they would retain possession of that information. Well, once people started to find out, they actually used the medium of Facebook to launch a protest that was ultimately successful. If we look at the UK experience with the national identity cards, No2ID and a number of other groups came up because they started, people started to realize that, wait a second, this isn't just something about some terrorist somewhere. This is about potentially myself having to carry a ID card to go to the grocery store to pick up a carton of milk. We can also look at the rise of public space groups, drivers organizations that are opposed to license capturing schemes and so on and so forth. We see a lot of people in discrete groups fighting discrete problems and what, they, what do they have in common? They're pissed off. Now, <coughs> What's interesting to me is that none of this has translated into a larger social movement. You look at the environmental movement or anti-globalization and so on, and you know you think, well, why not a pro-privacy or anti-surveillance social movement? Uh, my colleague Colin Bennett suggests that there's two reasons for this, particularly in the North American context. One is it, it hasn't sprung up yet because you need to have resources and once you have resources then you can mobilize. That means, in other words, we're waiting for something to happen. The second one, the second reason he suggests is that there's something inherent about these, this discrete bundle of issues that we call privacy, privacy or surveillance that makes um, this issue sort of difficult in itself, inherent in, in this issue, difficult to engender a social movement. And Bennett suggests that if that's the case, then this will never happen. Now, I'm an optimist, not a pessimist. So I'd like to focus on the second reason, that maybe there's some problems or issues inherent in privacy or surveillance that we need to address and that can be addressed. Well, what do we know about collective action? Well, first of all, we know that people need a common cause to come together. There's a collective sense of grievance. The reason why No2 ID and other groups sprung up in opposition to the National Identity Card Scheme in the UK was because more than one person thought, this is a bad idea. 
And there was a sort of sense of coming together and en masse, we can do something about this problem. So a collective sense of grievance is one issue. Now, we also know that there's a collective identity. We're for something. We're against something that brings people together and holds people together. And of course, going back to my comment about homo economicus, there's always a benefit and a cost or a set of benefits and costs to any type of activity. But in relation to collective action, the benefits could be a, a access, greater access to a public good or stopping infringements of people's rights. But there's also going to be costs, and those costs are going to include things like time, energy, psychic resources. I mean, getting involved in issues can take a psychic toll on people. Um, so those are the types of factors that we know go into what, what spawns a collective um, action and what sustains one. Now, in relation to privacy and surveillance, I'm going to suggest that there's three problems that need to be addressed. I think we could actually see a movement around this, but not until these three issues are addressed. And the first one I call, because I like to rip off rock bands, um, I'm calling it, it's the end of the world as we know it, and I feel fine. And that's the title of an REM song, and I think it's apropos here because one of the problems we have with privacy, the pro-privacy anti-surveillance issue, we have to demonstrate that there actually is a problem. In fact, that there's a set of problems. And that might seem kind of like a bit of a no-brainer, but hello, we're watching people trade away bits and pieces of their privacy every day. Um, I'm not going to point any fingers, but I did a little, everybody's looking to see who I'm looking at. Um, I did a little test. A uh, couple of months ago, my students were going on about Twitter. And I thought Twitter was something that you know, undergraduates do because it's more fun than listening to professors. So I you know, I've thought, oh, this is nothing, not, not a big deal. Then I subsequently found out that a number of people I know that were in their 40s and 50s were actually using Twitter to market their services. Or to a, a friend of mine who does charitable um, fundraising for charitable uh, organizations uses Twitter. So I started to think, like, what's with this Twitter? So I went and I checked out Twitter. And of course, because I am a, you know, pro-privacy, anti-surveillance, I created an ID for my cat. So my cat is on Twitter. And my cat went around and uh, looked up the names of various uh, surveillance scholars that I know who are, who are friends of mine to see who, who, which of them were on Twitter. And what do you know, but some of them were on Twitter. So then I got onto Facebook, and I find that a whole bunch of surveillance scholars are also on Facebook, which is kind of you know, fun because you know, we're always warning people about the dangers of social networking sites. And then, of course, it's our little guilty secret that we're all on there. Now, the reason why I point this out is because the reason why people use these sites is because they see a benefit to it. They're prepared to trade off bits and pieces of their privacy invite different people into their interior, interior world because they feel that they're getting a benefit from it. It might be a financial benefit from increased marketing. It could be a, a social or psychological benefit. I will make a confession. I met my husband on a social networking site. I won't say which one. Um, there's, we do these things because we, we accrue benefits. And so in order to sort of address these issues, we have to show that th there's actually hidden costs associated with things that people construe as being beneficial. Let's use airport scanners as an example. In 2004, Heathrow implemented those lovely full body scanners. Now, yours truly happened to go through Heathrow. Now, what happens, of course, is they've, they put them in Terminal 4, which is used by a lot of foreign traffic. So people from places like Canada didn't know they were there. And of course, they catch you when you're coming from the south of France or somewhere, you know, Bulgaria, you're exhausted. You get to Terminal 4 to make your connection. You have to go through security. 
So they say, would you mind coming with me to use this scanner? Well, I didn't actually think twice about it. Oh, okay, I'm exhausted. And subsequently, somebody said to me, why didn't you say no? Well, first of all, it never occurred to me I could say no. And second of all, when I started to talk to other people about why they would or would not use these scanners, which, by the way, they just rolled them out in Manchester Airport. They've been tried in Los Angeles, New York. Uh, McNamara in, in Detroit got one, and I understand that they're going to be used in airports across the United States. When people, when I start to ask people, would you say no? They say, well, you know, is it going to be faster? And so they're prepared to trade away a little bit of their privacy for some benefit being faster in the security line. Now, when I hit the border last night at the airport and they were giving me the third degree about why are you coming to the United States, um, I said I'm coming for a conference on national security, blah, 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 and they, and they said, well, what are you going to talk about? And I said, I'm going to talk about your airport scanners. <laughs> and the border agent, the U.S. <laughs> border agent, leaned over and said to me, I would say no. <laughs> I said, really? Why would you say no? She said, do you know what they can see? And I said, yes. And she said, bad. <laughs> and so, you know, that's a classic example of something. <laughs> that's confidential. Um, so again, it's, it's, it, there's a demonstrable problem, but you know, once you start, if I actually showed images to people that thought faster was better, they might have a problem. And so one of the things we have to consider is how we frame the problem. We have to make the cost-benefit calculation meaningful. The air miles is another, was a great example. If air miles collectors thought that the, all their information could go into a database to find terrorists, they might think twice about some of their loyalty card usage. Because really, I mean, we, don't, we always think these things are deployed against that person. It doesn't matter to us. But if it's, all, if it's the aggregate of all of our data, then technically it's all of our problem. We need to make that clear. Now, the second problem is what I call the what do you call this thing problem. So you want to have a social movement. Are you going to be pro-privacy or are you going to be anti-surveillance? Because as uh, somebody pointed out this morning, there's some framing issues around this. They are not necessarily the same thing. In fact, I argue that they are two sides of the same coin. They are not the same side of the same coin. If you want to, uh, now I'll do a little legal thing just to make the lawyers happy. Um, if you want to talk about this as a pro-privacy movement, potentially, then, okay, we're talking about a liberal notion of rights. And that means something. It means that any most types of remedies will be framed around the state and some type of action. That might be legal action or lobbying, government, so on and so forth, and, fra and creating this sort of discursive framework around the right of privacy. And I don't have a problem with that. But in doing that, one of the trade-offs is, and again, I, I, I think it was actually you that mentioned it earlier, we don't bring in the power dynamic, we don't make it explicit when we talk about privacy. And one of the things that talking about things in terms of surveillance does is it brings the power relation to the fore and forces us to focus beyond the state and the citizen to think about our relations to each other because this is not just a public problem. It's a public problem and it's a private problem and to the extent that we now have hybrids of public and private security, it's crossing boundaries and borders. And so issues around accountability and you're talking about audits are meaningless when we're talking about these hybrid models which we're increasingly seeing. Um, the third problem is the Hydra complex. One of the things with this set of issues is it has the capacity to be so amorphous that it becomes almost meaningless to the average person and creates a sense of, well, 
What the hell can I do? Because it's so big. It's so out there. It's the Facebook, it's the Twitter, it's the scanners, it's the ID cards, it's everywhere. Ugh. And so one of the, one of the things that a p potential, potential uh, movement organizers have to consider is that it can't, the problem can't be defined as so amorphous that it just b breaks down. But it also can't be too limited so that a variety of different issues that are really important get hived off. The temperance movement is a great example of, of where, you know, it, you have an identifiable object, booze is bad, and we've got identifiable social harms. And unfortunately, uh, this privacy, surveillance set, bundle of issues isn't going to ever be that simplistic to deal with. Now, having just given you all these like big woo, problems that we have to consider if we're interested in actually tackling these issues, I want to leave you with the sense that this is not totally hopeless. Um, I don't just throw these out there and say, well, it's your problem. Now I go back off to my elite academic ivory tower, which I will be. Um, but to, to give you a sort of sense that, you know, there are ways around these problems. The amorphous problem, go back to globalization. Does anybody know what the hell globalization is? Um, and yet we've got a social movement around anti-globalization. So it's it is possible to, to wrestle with that kind of shifting pattern. Um, in terms of sort of framing things, there's all sorts of egregious examples of that most people can agree are a violation of individual um, and, and group rights or sense of privacy. We should be starting to think about how we draw those links. Uh, one of the things I loved about Paul's presentation was the, the heads of the terrorists, and then they were all interconnected. Well, we need one of those graphic slides to show all the different, you know, let's put, I love innocent children. Let's put the heads of innocent children up that have had their rights violated, their privacy, you know, they were stopped at the border unfairly. Let's have that. Let's start to draw interconnections between these issues and make it much more tangible for people. And um, lastly, I mean, I said, I sort of framed this dichotomously. It's anti-surveillance. It's pro-privacy. Well, it, it can be both. As long as we recognize that we need to be careful about not murking the water so much that, again, we run into amorphousness. So at the end of the day, I'm hopeful. <laughs> Thank you. I'm happy that, is this working? Okay, I'll have to just get a little closer. Uh, I'm happy to not be the only uh, non-legal person on, on the panel, but I have felt a little out of my element, and I'm, at the end of the uh, long day, I'm going to introduce also something uh, completely new by returning to the lives of others, which, as Bob mentioned, opened the symposium uh, last night. The lives of others shows in chilling detail the ways in which the East German Ministry for State Security infiltrated all aspects of a person's life, in this case, a playwright, his workplace, his home, even his circle of friends. It gives both a name and face to Big Brother. It is the Captain Wiesler who, over the course of the film, evolves from good Stasi to a good man who develops an empathy for the object of surveillance who he had been trained to think of as an enemy of the state. 
Now, there are various acts of resistance in the film that I'd like to talk about, um, just to show how even in a very hermetically sealed um, surveillance society like the GDR, resistance was possible. And in the case of the film, it wasn't only the actions of the former East Germans, uh, the East German, uh, but rather the perpetrators, the Stasi themselves, who were uh, con committing their acts of resistance. The Stasi officer does this by betraying the Stasi and um, undermining the objectives of their uh, plans. He withholds and falsifies the reports about the playwright in the unsuccessful attempt to protect the playwright and the actress from their fates. At an important level, the film is about the transform transformative power of art and literature. In, his, in the course of the surveillance, Wiesler is exposed to literature and music that open up new worlds of meaning and beauty for him. If the film's message is one of resistance to power, then it is a resistance that is informed by and expressed through art. And, and because of that, I would like to talk about some of the ways in which literature and the GDR constituted an informal substitute public culture. So how was it possible to live a normal life in this state? And how was it possible to escape surveillance? And what uh, role did and could literature play? These are some of the topics I would like to uh, address in my time. The German Democratic Republic was the quintessential police state and surveillance was an aspect of everyday life. Everyone was aware of it. No one could really see it unless you uh, engaged in the kind of uh, joking speculation about what those two men on a train station wearing the fake leather jackets were doing um, without luggage. In other words, they were watching the movements of travelers in and out of the, of the train station. Um, the Stasi was atten attempted to be invisible, but was largely uh, visible and the joke of, of uh, many East Germans. The GDR was also a one-party state for all intents and purposes. One only need to look at the following. The absence of fundamental democratic rights that we cherish and have seen uh, eroding somewhat here um, did not even exist there. They are the protection of the inalienable uh, human rights, protection of private property, equality before the law, the separation of powers, and an independent judiciary. None of those existed. The GDR was, to use Michel Foucault's term, a panopticon, um, where the sense of an invisible omniscience was pervasive, and surveillance was, quote, permanent in its effects, even if it is discontinuous in its action, and where the perfection of power rendered its actual exercise unnecessary. Now, just to review, some of you will have, known, have seen the film, but what was the Ministry for State Security and how did it operate? What you see behind me is one of its most uh, infamous pre-trial detention centers where people could disappear for up to a year where they would be held without uh, access to a lawyer, uh, without any rights of representation um, until the Stasi had obtained the signed confession that they uh, were uh, wanting. They were um, brought to these prisons under the cloak of night in these vans that uh, drove around the GDR for hours at a time so that the individual arrived entirely disoriented, um, not knowing where they were, and of course unable to notify family that uh, they had been um, detained. These detention centers were um, throughout the GDR, but this was one of the most infamous ones, and this is the scene in the opening of the lives of others. Now, the Ministry for State Security was a vast bureaucratic apparatus. It functioned as a political police to carry out the uh, resolutions of the uh, Communist Party, and its sole purpose, or primary purpose, was the prevention of political crimes and the investigation of political crimes. This allowed it broad access into all domains of, of everyday life, and there was hardly an area of professional life that wasn't in some way impacted by Stasi surveillance. The Stasi had a large army of unofficial collaborators at its disposal who were the eyes and ears of the party, 
and who were considered to be the main weapon against uh, the enemy. Par paternalism and paranoia really characterized uh, the state and gave it its motto of the state has to know everything and the state knows best. So these were the two kind of underwriting um, motivations behind the state's functioning and justifications for the existence of, of the state security. What I'm going to show you now are simply just a few of the uh, slides I have here. You see it is, has met, been now con uh, converted into a memorial museum where former political prisoners uh, give tours and tell about their incarceration, tell about the various uh, reasons that they were imprisoned there, and walk the, the tourists through the prison in, um, and provide um, details of what it was like to be uh, incarcerated during GDR times. Um, this is the prison from the outside and its location on a map. These prisons were not known to East Germans because they were not indicated on maps produced in the GDR. They were either uh, misrepresented as uh, industrial parks or um, simply not indicated at all. Well, how is that possible in a city the size of Berlin? The Stasi lived, Stasi officers lived around the prison so that um, people walking by wouldn't be wondering what it was. They worked there and were intimately involved with it. Here are the large gates, the surveillance from above, the guard towers, what you might expect in any prison system, except this was not a usual prison uh, system at all. It was a political um, prison, and um, the majority of people there um, were there for having attempted to escape the GDR. In the 1980s, three quarters of political prisoners were people who had attempted to uh, unlegally leave the GDR. And um, that was the extent of their crime. Even knowledge of someone's <laughs> attempt to leave the GDR was a punishable offense and could, could land you in jail. This now uh, is a scene from, or is an image of the, the famous uh, submarine basement, which was used uh, largely in the 50s and 60s until the new building was built. This is where uh, the Soviet uh, uh, occupation force uh, really tortured former Nazis and uh, where the conditions were most horrible. I'll pass through some of those pictures, but you see how um, former prisoners walk through these, these uh, scenes and illustrate the, uh, the effects of surveillance. So I'll leave that there. Only at trial would a prisoner meet their lawyer for the first time, and it was only at trial when they first learned of the charges that were brought up against them. So uh, it's a very different kind of political system than we know, and once one was captured and detained, you were really within the, uh, the total surveillance mechanism of, of the state, uh, writ small here in, in, the, uh, in, the in the prison itself. Now, what were the possibilities for resistance in the GDR? Because although it was a, a very effective police state, people lived normal, ordinary lives and were, were in fact able to uh, resist in a number of ways. First of all, nonconformism and non-participation. Simply by not joining the party or not part participating in some of the enforced uh, political rituals, such as uh, a kind of secular uh, alternative to Christian confirmation known as Jugendweihe, um, you stepped outside of the mechanisms designed to create the socialist personality within the socialist community. So non-participation in these youth groups and in uh, various movements. <clears throat> Secondly, retreating into the public sphere, uh, private sphere, and into subcultures. The GDR has been called the niche society, in part because in order to escape the demands of the state, the individual would simply retreat into one's private space, establishing informal networks, um, which count constituted a counter public sphere. 
This was called vitamin B for Beziehungen, or the connections that one needed in order to survive. Everyone made jokes about, oh, I had a shot of my vitamin B, having seen, uh, met friends and been together with them. Third, selective interaction with the state and accommodation. The East German uh, Protestant churches coined a term for this accommodation. They called it the church in socialism. In other words, acknowledging that the church had to work within the existing constraints and political uh, um, opportunities that, the, that the, the state represented. Working within the system also meant utilizing state-sanctioned um, channels for protest, and there were some. Those of you who might have seen the film uh, Goodbye Lenin will remember that um, the mother in the play uh, writes these petitions to the state. So there were op avenues and opportunities for petitioning the state, um, but they were largely uh, conscribed. Finally, when working within the system was no longer possible, emigration was uh, an option. But to submit an application for emigration meant that you were subjecting yourselves to the, the chicanery of the system uh, because you would often be fired from your job, you'd be put under su surveillance um, if you hadn't been already. So that was, um, that along with trying to escape were really the, the last desperate measures uh, that people uh, took in order to try to get out from underneath uh, the surveillance. Because there was no genuine public sphere in the GDR, literature functioned as an alternative public sphere. And here I'd like to just talk a little bit about the, the literature of the GDR and how it is, has been shaped by the, um, the GDR state. The party saw art and literature as a weapon in the class struggle, but it had an uneasy relationship with its writers, uh, a legacy that goes back to Marxism and the uh, profound distrust that Marx had for the bourgeois origins of the intelligentsia. In the film, the minister uh, says to uh, the uh, says in praise of writers that they are the engineers of the state or engineers of the soul. But it would be more accurate, really, to describe um, writers and how they were approached by the SED as the engineers of the engineers. This constraint on artistic independence is depicted in one of the most riveting and powerful scenes in the film. And here I'll quote from it where the actress and playwright confront one another about their own uh, succumbing to political pressures. She says, don't I need this system? They alone determine who will act, who is permitted to act and direct. She reiterates the same reality that the minister had said in an earlier scene when he says, artists need the state more than the state needs the artists. Now, officially, there was no censorship in the GDR, but that did not mean that free expression was possible. Um, there was censorship, and it uh, happened in a variety of ways, largely that the state, the state and the Stasi were involved at all levels of literary production. And so um, even trying to get something published meant putting oneself before a large body of censors who would look for any signs of political deviance. Uncomfortable authors whose works were censored had a few options, one of which was to publish in the West or to emigrate to the West where publishing conditions were more favorable. The effect was that there was a suppression of critical and independent thought, a form of self-censorship before words were even put on paper or submitted for publication. And now I want to make a recommendation for those of you who might be looking for a non-legal uh, reading on the effects of surveillance. And that is a work by uh, Krista Wolf. It's entitled What Remains. It's been translated into English, and it's a very uh, wonderful account of the debilitating effects of surveillance on a writer as she uh, remains within her apartment afraid to go out. Her narration becomes increasingly self-absorbed, uh, this really kind of inner monologue in which she's talking with herself because she's cut off all contacts with friends who she doesn't trust. And um, it's a wonderful account of just how um, how much surveillance really had a kind of psychological effect on, on writers. 
she is really in a state of de deliberating and debilitating uh, paralysis. And that is something that I think um, is only resolved at the end of the story. And I will conclude in a moment with a, that last excerpt from the passage of her book. Um, in the film, one of the potentially dangerous moments of, of lapsing from self-censorship is when the playwright appeals on behalf of his friend to this minister of culture and asks him to lift the censorship or his blacklisting. And the minister says to him, what? We have no censorship in the GDR. What are you talking about? You should be more careful in your word choice. And this exchange illustrates, I think, really in a lovely way, just how there were very separate realities about the GDR um, from the Stasi and from uh, its victims. And the intellectually and morally bankrupt system could only reply with kind of tired cliches and, and denials of, of oppression. And I think that really characterized the way in which one didn't find in the state an adequate kind of partner for any dialogue or about the possibility of reform because the state was so entrenched in its own uh, ideology and saw any attempt at dialogue and reform as, as a threat to the stability of the regime. Um, in, the two, in the film, there are two modes of behavior that connect the Stasi perpetrators with the victim, others, watching and writing. The paranoid gaze of the state is not confined only to the Stasi operatives. Just as the Stasi ceaselessly um, observes its objects and suspicious, suspiciously monitors its own personnel, East German citizens themselves were apprehensively observing party members and also checking for signs of betrayal among their friends and colleagues. There's only one scene in the film where the two male protagonists are in the same frame, but they do not see one another. Their gaze is on the actress, whom they have both betrayed, who lies dying in the street. It is in an interesting role reversal. At the end of the film, you have the observed observing the observer um, during GDR times. It's the playwright who is the unobserved observer, watching the former Stasi captain who had infiltrated his life delivering advertisements after the collapse of the GDR. Finally, the even more intriguing aspect is in writing as a form of, of resistance. And here, too, we can see how literature serves to counter the dehumanizing effects of surveillance and serves as a vehicle for a reconciliation between observer and observed, who are, in fact, reconciled to one another at the end of the film. Their separate acts of, of um, subversion take the form of writing. The Stasi officer enters into the foray of fictional literature as he begins to falsify his reports in order to protect um, the playwright. And the playwright begins to become the enemy that he never was, but was created by the Stasi, um, in that he begins to write subversive literature recording the suicide rates in the GDR and publishing them in the West. Finally, I'm going to close with the, um, the end quote from Krista Wolf's What Remains, because I think it really shows how she has come through this two-year peri period of surveillance and comes out of the, this shadow and this dark period and is able to once again find hope in the prospect of writing to reclaim her, uh, her original enthusiasm for her profession, but also to discover her public voice again in a way that she had lost it. This time, she says, they almost got me. This time, whether they had been trying or not, they had found the weak point, which I would describe one day in my new language, one day not now, I will be able to speak easily and freely, I thought. It is still too soon, but it won't always be too soon. Why not simply sit down at this desk, by the light of this lamp, shuffle the paper into place, take up my pen, and begin to write? What remains? What is at the root of my city, and what is rotting it from within? That there is no misfortune other than that of not being alive, and in the end, no desperation other than that of not having lived. Thank you.
know it's been a long day, but I hope that the panel has provoked some questions on your part, and we do have some time for some questions. Just, just so that we don't die. <laughs> this one's actually for Laura, um, on on the basically the sociology of privacy. You, you expressed your um, uh, your hope for the development of a national of a global privacy uh, movement, um, and I, I guess what I, I want to ask you is, do you really see any evidence that the interest in that as an issue is broader than? Uh, uh, broader than the people in this room, and, and uh, I don't mean just the people in this room, but kind of uh, elites, lawyers, and people like that. What I, what I mean is, you know, we live in a world where most people are happy to go on Jerry Springer and talk about anything, where, you know, presidential candidates will say, will answer the question, boxers or briefs, and without even think. I mean, and, and my own experience at, uh, in the government was we couldn't actually get our new employees to keep secrets uh, that they should be keeping because they live in a world uh, where Facebook it more or less counsels them to put everything out there. But they don't. So I'm wondering uh, about whether there's sociological evidence you know, that actually um, suggests that this privacy issue is one of, of as broad a sweep as, as I, I know you hope it would be, but, uh, but in terms of people really caring? Yeah. No, I think that's a really good question. It's something I struggled with when I when I looked started looking at resistance. Um, and actually the reality of it is is that people want they want privacy. Even the people that are, you know, posting naked pictures of themselves on Facebook, they want the the thing about privacy is it's about the control of the information that you put out in the public sphere. And the, there's, a di there's a difference to be drawn from what I choose to put out about myself versus what somebody else takes from me or what somebody else collects surreptitiously or what they collect for one purpose but then use for another. And then once that's, a, it's, about, it's an issue about control. I mean, go, going back to this whole thing about power, and one of the reasons why I said the power dynamic has to be made explicit regardless of how we decide to frame this. Um, because that's essentially what people are arguing about. I was fascinated by these three talks, and I think they really hang together uh, well. I've got what I think is a connection that also goes to Paul's point here. I was constantly reminded with this question of literature as resistance about Bertolt Brecht's theory that, that we'll know there's literature in the Soviet Union when a novel can begin with the line, Minsk is the most boring city in the world. Mm. Uh, and then Stefan Heim wrote the essay on the boredom of Minsk. But for there to be a literature about the boredom of Minsk that passes the market test, there has to be a market for it. There has to be a market for social movements. There has to be a market that's mobilized to resist these sorts of things. Um, and yet, the market is constantly bombarded with messages to accept this, messages to accept this, that uh, when, when you go through that scanner, there's the utilitarian pragmatic choice. It's going to be faster if I don't uh, complain about it. There is also the the TSA is there for your safety, and if you question the TSA methods, you're only supporting terrorism and making flying unsafe for yourself and all of your uh, fellow uh, travelers, uh, in the benign sense of that word. Um, you know, so, so there are powerful social forces that socialize us not to resist. And, and it's very difficult for an economic market or a sociological market to coalesce to resist that and to insist that somebody write about the boredom of Minsk. Yeah. Um, do you want to talk about Bertolt Brecht? Uh, no, <laughs> <laughs> not necessarily, but, uh, but you're absolutely right. And uh, in the case of the GDR, there was that, uh, that audience because people were craving a literature that wasn't uh, sanctioned by the state and in some ways shaped by cultural policies laid down 
uh, for authors by the state in, in these various state uh, uh, Congress meetings. So um, that's why the, the role of the uh, writer in the GDR ha was extraordinary. The, the writer in the GDR had a social function that far outweighs the, writers, the social function of writers in democratic societies. Uh, and they were really looked to for as as kind of spokespeople for um, the real everyday experiences that um, people hoped the literature would reflect. And part of the uh, irony about citing uh, Krista Wolf's work is that uh, she was uh, reviled by former, uh, um, well, but largely by West German audiences, but um, but really. East Germans were also very disappointed to learn that she had collaborated with the Stasi when she had been um, a young student at the university, um, even uh, as that admission or that acknowledgement came out after having written about her, uh, the effects of being under Stasi surveillance. And people looked to writers as a kind of, the kind of conscience of the nation, that they were supposed to in some way, because they had privileges, um, that they were supposed to um, somehow overcome that very natural fear that Wolf describes of being under surveillance, that there was an expectation that their life was easier and so they should be more bold in, in their actions and in their private lives. And I think in some ways that was an unfair uh, expectation. Um, I think part of the problem is, and, I, and Michael Vaughn and I were talking about this at lunch, it's the discursive framing of these issues. They're, they play to all sorts of symbolic um, relationships and, and um, you know, I was making fun about the terrorist heads earlier on, but quite frankly, I mean, the cynical side of me says, you know, everybody else uses innocent children as cells. You know, you know, if you don't do this, this child is going to die. So, you know, how about if we have some children turned away at the airport or something and we can, you know, I, and I'm kind of joking about this, but really where I'm going with this is that I don't think that the privacy advocates have been able to successfully create an alternative discursive framework for addressing these issues. And um, maybe we need to get like Cameron Diaz and some celebrities on board because that, that, you know, certainly helps with other types of movements, um, being cynical again. But really, I think we need to come up with some sort of framework that really addresses the things for people on an individual level rather than abstract, you know, everybody can be scared of terrorists. But talking about an abstract thing about, you know, invasion of privacy and what that means, privacy is a relative concept. So we need to find a way to make it resonate. Um, let's go Lear first and we'll work around. Oh, okay. I mean, either way. Uh, both. But, um. <laughs> my, my comment is very quick. It picks up on polls and it picks up on Mary Beth's. Um, privacy advocates in, in, in Canada are very uh, jealous of privacy advocates in Germany, for example, on the issue of whether or not there is a popular base of mm -hmm. movement, there's tens of thousands of people in the streets in Germany protesting against data retention laws, if you can imagine anything so esoteric, on the motto Stasi 2.0, yeah. right? What we lack here in North America is the ability to explain in a soundbite who the Stasi were, because we don't know here. Um, but when you have this background, again, even listening to your talk, I just find it chilling in terms of check, 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 right? Temperature going up on everything that you pointed out. But it's like we've lost the historical framework to understand what that means. So I, I, think, I think there is the potential for that popular movement, but it comes in in terms of these cultural contexts. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, actually, I wanted to talk to exactly that point as well. Um, I actually come from Germany, and um, I grew up there, and there is definitely a lot more awareness of this. On the other hand, um, you come to the U.S., and you feel actually that there is a much bigger concern with privacy here when you talk about individual privacy, having people not step onto your property and, mm -hmm. and so on. So it's a very funny um, thing. You come here, and you feel that people are very private about certain things, about their possessions, about you know, um, the kind of, but on the other hand, you go to Germany and then you have actually these public movements and people are very much scared of um, people containing their data and so on. Um, 
On the flip side, though, they might be walking around with a, a Stasi 2.0 on their shirts demonstrating, but we have actually a movement of um, complete nostalgia for East Germany as well that is on the other side, which is very, very strange where you completely deny any of these movements. And I mean, the, play, the, the film does play into this a little bit too because of course we have a Stasi officer who is a good guy. He's not going to um, report on this person. He's going to falsify. He fictionalizes the reports and so on. And um, so we have... In some sense, while we have on the one hand, we're using the Stasi to create this, this movement and mobilize people. On the other hand, we actually don't really give a voice very much to people who really did suffer under the Stasi. Their suffering is very much ignored. Um, on the contrary, you actually have more people who were collaborating with the Stasi in the public light, and it does not necessarily adversely affect them anymore. There's, um, um, apart from Christa Wolf, there's a whole number of other writers who are like, well, yeah, okay, I collaborated, so what? You know, so, um, and then also in, in politics and so on, yes, some were not allowed to keep their functions anymore, but at this point, very much a relaxed um, way of dealing with people who were involved in the Stasi. Any responses? Well, since it's about the Stasi, Stasi. I guess um, one thing that I would say, um, in earlier panels, the question was raised, how will we know uh, that, there were, that we were uh, subject to surveillance? Well, in a kind of uh, sarcastic way, one could say, well, wait for a regime change. Uh, mm -hmm. That's what happened to the GDR. Uh, one of the last uh, official acts of the last uh, East German government was the passage of the Stasi file law, which, uh, first of all, preserved the laws and guaranteed the access uh, to these files for each individual who was a victim of Stasi surveillance um, and to scholars, uh, historical and legal scholars. So uh, these files have been preserved and um, of course in good German record keeping tradition about which we talked last night, uh, there's, there are miles and miles of, of records, some of which are uh, ridiculous in the banality of the information and others reveal quite devastating uh, facts of betrayal that, just like in the film, people were unaware of. Uh, one person said to me, the Stasi uh, knew everything, but they didn't understand a thing. And so they had all these facts, but they couldn't often kind of put the facts together into a, a coherent ex explanation for why people did what they did. An, an interesting irony in today's Tagesspiegel the composition of the new government is becoming clear, and it appears that the new Minister of the Interior will be the last Minister President of the German uh -huh. Democratic Republic, Lothar de Maizière, yeah, right. uh, who was responsible for this law. Right. So I, I guess one just brief comment, just based on, on yours. Um, uh, you know, when we talk about the victims of the Stasi, we're talking about the former threats to national security. Like the, it's the same people, and it is a change in in labeling and uh, marketing, if you will. I don't know, but it's uh, the the exact same people, the exact same acts in you know 25 years or 35 years ago were threats to national security. Now they're you know crimes against victims. Right. Resistors against the National Socialists were in ill odor throughout the. I was interested in your analysis of the, of, of the film. I thought the turning point for the captain was mm -hmm. uh, to, to assist the, the victim that he was uh, surveying was the abuse um, of power by the Minister of Culture who wanted to have a relationship with uh, Krista Maria uh, uh, and get uh, her boyfriend, who was a playwright, out of the picture. And so that was the real reason for the surveillance of the playwright, as I, as I understood it. That's right, that's um, right. So uh, that, I think, had an influence on that captain mm -hmm. who decided that uh, it, was being, it was being abused. Um, I'm reminded her, I was recently listening to some tapes by Michael Bieslosh as I was traveling, and uh, uh, he talked about Roosevelt as a, as a courageous president did the destroyer deal and so on. But one of the things that Roosevelt uh, 
did was uh, Jackson had, as Attorney General, had said that the Supreme Court had ruled against wiretapping. You can't do wiretapping. Roosevelt issued an executive order saying we will do wiretapping without probable cause. And uh, then he went to Herbert Hoover and tried to get Hoover to wiretap Wendell Wolfe, his uh, political mm -hmm. opponent, uh, see if he could get some dirt on Wolfe's father and on his paramour relationship with a lady by the name of Marita Van Dorn. Uh, Hoover, in one of his courageous stances, said he would not do it because he was worried that uh, Wolfe might be elected and that he would be obvious. <laughs> so the wiretapping mm -hmm. for the, or the abuse of it has gone back for many, many years and to some of our great icons. I think. Uh, this is a first for me saying something redemptive about J. Edgar Hoover, <laughs> but it was J. Edgar Hoover, not Herbert Hoover that you... I said J. Well, okay. Um, um, responses? Anyone? Um, I think we're going to make Julia the last question because we've run over. I, I guess this is addressed really to anybody on the panel, but uh, to what extent um, the situation in, in the United States right now is a little bit different from the situation in Germany because there it was Germans, um, you know, undermining other Germans. Mm -hmm. Whereas in the United States, uh, to what extent do you think um, the reason that there isn't an opposition or kind of stronger opposition to the policies uh, is because we're actually um, targeting an unpopular minority? Um, and, and I have to use the word Muslim, a Muslim minority. Um, and that's kind of absent in the debate because their voice is not here. Um, we work for a Muslim organization, who, and on a daily basis, we see um, you know, deportations of people who've refused to become informants. We see people whose visas have been stripped because they donated $250 to an, an organization that was on a list. Uh, you know, we see single mothers deported in the war on terrorism because they've fallen under status and they're deported under the Alien Absconder Apprehension Initiative. We see people, uh, you know, U.S. Air um, National Guard people, you know, strip searched at the border and have their political writings put in front of them, and these are American citizens. So we have a long litany list of people who have really suffered these kinds of, um, you know, degradations, even though they're American citizens, but they're an unpopular minority and and it's okay because this isn't happening to the to the majority of people it's happening to this unpopular minority so to what extent do you think um, you know there can be changes when this particular minority has actually been chilled because they're now depoliticized and they're frightened to be able to come forward and speak out uh, you know that they have endured these um, you know degradations uh, so if you could comment on that I guess uh, I can I can start. Um, I think um, uh, the the abuses and and the you know the the things that you've described are are really a, a terrible consequence of the environment of fear that has been created and and that was particularly pervasive uh, during the eight years. My hope is that we're moving beyond that, um, but I think the the problem is really one of concentration of power. Um, in the federal government. And I think the idea of, um, you know, choosing an other, whoever it, or whatever group it might be, is a very familiar tactic. I think it's one that's been used again and again. Um, and, you know, I think that, um, you know, again, my hope is that we, we move beyond that. Um, in terms of what, how can we change, I think it's an inertia problem. I think that, um, as uh, the other panelists have said, and, and many people have, have stated earlier today, um, the, the issue is that people just don't care in some ways. And unless it happens to them or unless they can see a tangible uh, effect, unless they can put a face to the other side of the threat to national security, then it's very difficult to see, well, how does this affect me? You know, one of the reasons that I, I wanted to bring the, the video of Peter Chase is because it puts a face to um, uh, the, the other side. It's not just oh, this ethereal or you know, elusive concept of privacy. It's actually that this person couldn't do things. And it's not that he, just that he couldn't do things. It's more that he was afraid and he was afraid of doing things. And he felt fear and anxiety and was put in a position where he couldn't act in 
a, a way that he should have been able to act. He should have been able to accept all these speaking, speaking engagements. He should have been able to carry out his, his professional job and duties as a librarian. He should have been able to do all those things. And I don't think we hear enough of the stories like Peter Chase. Um, and I think that, that we need to do a better job of that. Um, and you know, if it takes you know, uh, some celebrity uh, campaign mm -hmm. or something like that, um, you know, I think ultimately we do need to think about our efforts in order to, to, uh, to educate people about this. I think that, one, you know, one of the comments that um, was made earlier about the, 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 the words that we're using, even to describe the issues. I mean, I prefer a language that uh, includes national security and personal security. That I think when we talk about privacy, the natural response is, oh, well, but I don't have anything to hide. So why would I be afraid of this? Well, no, it's that you have a right to personal security, to personal safety, to a sense of security. And that's what was taken from Peter Chase. That's the thing that was uh, on the other side of the coin or the other side of the equation, whatever you want to phrase it. And, and I don't think that we uh, do a good enough job of, of describing that. And we do need better examples. We need uh, more faces like Peter um, and more people uh, to, to show that type of bravery to come forward and... Um, and even to seek the help of the ACLU in that situation was, I think, a very brave thing to do. Mm. Um, I'd like to jump in. I totally agree with your comments. Mm. Now, of course, I'm not, I don't live in the United States. I, ha I, I have a, the Canadian experience where one of the pu major public faces on issues related to um, national security gone awry is Mayor Arar, who was, uh, an ex is an his, he and his wife are just extremely courageous individuals. Um, it's, I have to totally agree with you as well because um, it seems to me, and I'm not the first person to make this claim, the United States loves war. And I mean that in the context of the war imagery and this discursive framework about we have a war on poverty, a war on drugs, a war on terrorism. We got lots of wars. We had a war on communism, you know. And what happens when you go to war is you pick an enemy and you demonize that enemy and you vilify them and then the ends, the means are always justified because of the greater good of the ends. And I think that you're absolutely right in that from what I've seen in talking on these issues at the national level of the United States, I have yet to see uh, very, uh, anybody actually, any person of color to be honest with you, uh, come forward and talk about these things. I mean, the poster boy for a while was Teddy Kennedy on why no-fly lists and, na and national security lists and so on are problematic. And then it became an issue, I'm sorry to say, but because this is a privileged, uh, white, uh, wealthy individual, and oh, he, could, he should never have been on that list. That's clearly a mistake. Um, but he's hardly the only person that's been affected or was the only person that's been affected by that. And uh, as long, you know, we need to see more brave people step forward, but I completely agree with you. There is definitely a chilling effect. And I guess in the East German context, there were no uh, officially recognized minority groups per se, but uh, I understand your point. And I think uh, overcoming fear, I mean, certainly East Germans were conditioned from a very early age to keep one's head down not to call attention to oneself, to obey in as much as was possible. And so there was this, this climate of fear and this conditioning that created a kind of um, outward obedience. Even if one didn't necessarily uh, agree with things, one didn't stick their neck out. And you mentioned collective action. And it wasn't um, really um, until the 1980s when uh, citizens' initiatives were formed uh, where, uh, in a really kind of interesting act and move of kind of popular counter-surveillance, citizens' groups monitored the elections and um, conducted polls as people came out of the exit polls and determined that, in fact, these over- uh, uh, embellished uh, figures of 98 point some percent uh, for the SED was grossly exaggerated, but it was, wasn't until they started turning their kind of gaze on the state and on these uh, policing mechanisms that they were empowered by their knowledge um, and by their kind of collective action. And, and finally, the GDR simply imploded when um, the 
govern the uh, government of Hungary opened its border to Austria and they saw then the mass exodus of East Germans fleeing the country. They had no idea that they were as unpopular as they were uh, because they had kind of deceived themselves with their own elections. There were, um, at the height of the popularity of the, of the party, only 20% uh, of the people were party members. So these 80% <laughs> were not supporters, but they went along up to a point when they finally uh, had that momentum and that uh, had been able to overcome fear. So I think collective action is a, a kind of key word for how to, how to change. And I will close just by jumping in very briefly on this last set of comments um, with a couple of observations. First of all, one of the problems about how to develop a social movement in response to overreaching surveillance is the problem that overreaching, uh, getting rid of overreaching surveillance, containing it, is a collective good. And you have the usual problem of um, why would an individual uh, step outside of the line uh, to pr help produce a collective good? Um, if I say, no, I don't want to go through the scanner, well, the strip search, which may be their counter, is certainly not going to be pleasant. Um, so it's not simply time, energy, money. It may be uh, repressive consequences or retaliatory consequences. And um, so who then are the people who are in a position to see this not as a collective good, but something that's very individualized? Well, they tend to be uh, people who are, who are marginalized, who are politically uh, weak because they are members of un unpopular groups where the consequences may be especially high to um, challenging as opposed to accommodating and, and going along. Um, the, second, the second observation I'd like to make is that the meta story that we've told ourselves is that at uh, times of war, uh, the, the rules change, and um, uh, Justice, uh, former Chief Justice Rehnquist, or the late Chief Justice Rehnquist, wrote a book uh, on this subject. And, and others have made the same observation, that there's a kind of pendulum swing. And then we say after the fact, oh my god, we got rid of the writ of habeas corpus. We had martial law. Um, we hung a few people during the Civil War who maybe should have gotten for real trials. Uh, oh my God, we interned the Japanese. Um, oh my God, we did those terrible things in, uh, under the um, uh, uh, Sedition and Espionage Acts where uh, a filmmaker who makes a movie in which he portrays uh, British uh, 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 savagery towards American colonists during the, the revolution uh, ends up in jail and end ultimately in Germany and perishing in the Holocaust because he violates the, um, the Sedition Act by undermining loyalty to one of our allies in World War I. Uh, and then we, and we look at that and say, oh gee, uh, we've learned our lesson, uh, you got to understand, uh, we get panicky, and the pendulum swings back. And that's the, that's the meta story, and there's, some, there's something to that, uh, that we do tend to step back. Um, but one has to worry about whether, um, whether, in fact, the pendulum is going to swing back. And what happens when you isolate the other and you make this law uh, directed in the specific case of our fears and our panics, and it only, we're only talking about them, is you're making law. Uh, and law can be very sticky. Uh, and whether or not um, the pendulum swings back, if you want to use that metaphor, well, I think that's where those, that social movement is, is going to be necessary unless, as Mary Beth hopefully suggested, art does have redemptive qualities that will help us all. 
Um, we've run long, I'm sorry about that. Uh, there is a reward outside um, uh, in the lower rotunda, just follow around that way. Uh, an opportunity to, um, to continue the conversation. And please join me in thanking not only this panel, but all our panelists.